history tells the story of the world and of our lives. Sometimes that history goes bump in the night. Broadcasting from the center of oddity and the supernatural in Central Florida, it's the History Goes Bump podcast. Hello, you spectacular people. Welcome to this 110th episode of the History Ghost Bump podcast. Ghost tours for the theater of the mind. I am your host, Diane. And this is Denise. And on today's episode, we have a location suggested by our listener, Becky, the Felt Mansion in Sagatuck, Michigan. Have you ever heard of this place, Denise? I have not. I never had either, but it's a very interesting location. It appears to be quite haunted And there's even an urban legend to go along with it. So I'm looking forward to sharing it with everybody. I am too. Before we get into that, we do want to point you in the direction of our website, historygoesbump.com. And Denise, if people want to send us some feedback via email, where can they do that? They can do that at historygoesbump at gmail.com. And we did get a few emails that we want to share with everybody. Tom Wright emailed us and said, Hi, ladies. I am really enjoying your podcast, and I'm listening to the most recent and then listening to the oldest next. I really like how you cover multiple topics like the oddity and then the major topic. Keep up the good work. I may be in Orlando in the fall, like September. So I said, Hey, let us know when you're here. Yeah, we love to do meetups. Amy Martinez also sent us this interesting email about owls. Ooh, owls are very intelligent and very mysterious. I'm not sure if you ladies have ever heard of the legends surrounding owls in Mexico and around the South Texas area, but it's pretty fascinating. My husband is part Mexican, and he's been raised to believe that owls are bruja, a witch. Here's a story my husband told me, and I know he's telling the truth because he really was scared. One night while driving the back roads, which is basically every rural town in Texas... He and his friend were in his friend's truck when something large flew into their path and they hit it. They got out of the truck to investigate and it was an owl. My husband told his friend to leave it there and not to mess with it. He said the bird was obviously dead. His friend decided he wanted to take the owl and maybe have it stuffed. My husband tried very hard to coax him to leave it and told him that the owl was a witch. But the friends threw the owl into the back of the truck. This is one of those trucks that have the sliding glass on the back window and this one was opened. My husband kept looking back at the unmoving owl in the back of the truck, but after a while, he started to relax. They were almost at the friend's house when my husband looked up and noticed that the owl was sitting in the opened glass window, alive and well, looking around and blinking its huge eyes. My husband grabbed the handle and was already jumping out of the truck before it was completely stopped. He told the friend to get rid of it, and he didn't want to know how. Then he walked the rest of the way to the friend's house. If my husband sees an owl, the hair on his arms will raise and he'll get goosebumps. Then he crosses the air and says a prayer. And as an update, she also said, I asked my husband about this story after I sent it. He told me that they were actually at the friend's grandfather's lake house. And the grandfather told the friend he didn't need to be messing with the owl because they're bad news. So he let the owl go down by the water's edge. It was a narrow slough that stretched quite a distance from the yard to the other bank. My husband said he could see the owl well because it was a full moon and there were headlights on it. He watched the owl take off across the water like a duck to the other bank and fly away. But owls don't have webbed feet. Well, that's a pretty creepy story. Uh, Yes, it is. All I have to say is maybe that owl was very hardy and they knocked him out and he happened to wake up and was sitting in the window like, what the hell hit me? Yeah, that would creep me out. We got a bunch of messages on the fan page to share with you guys. Lori Blackburn. I'm a truck driver, so I'm listening to the radio a lot. I recently got into podcasts and came across yours. Love it. Thanks for the ghost stories and histories. Stephen Stratton from Southport, UK, messaged us and left a comment on the website. Thanks for your kind comments, and he suggested a great location for us. Doug Dotson's message, I have just discovered your podcast. I am in Kannapolis, North Carolina, and I love the Old Salem episode. I actually have great-great-grandparents buried there. And we also got a message from Chelsea Schott. Hi, my name is Chelsea. I'm from Columbus, Ohio, and I discovered your podcast yesterday and love it. I listen to it all day at work through my iPhone. It's so interesting, and I can't get enough. If you guys are still open to suggestions, I have one for you. And she gave us a great one. And yeah, for anybody, you're always welcome to send us suggestions. We're just letting you know it probably won't be until maybe July that you'll hear about it, because that's just how many 
requests we've gotten in. So uh, be patient, but we will get to your stuff. And if you send us more than one, just know that you'll get one done, and then it's going to be a while before you get the other one just so we can get everybody into the rotation. Gina Gwynn commented back on the Winchester episode, I wonder if the mystery house served as a kind of bottle tree. The old tales go that spirits could be lured into the bottles and could not escape. Check out this explanation by a favorite writer of mine, Catherine Tucker Wyndham, who wrote often about ghosts. I thought that was a really interesting theory, that it was a way to kind of trap the ghosts, maybe even, rather than trying to escape them. That could very well be. And I've always said it's very interesting when you see those bottle trees, in, especially in, in the New Orleans area, where it's just a tree with just all these different bottles just hanging. They look really cool. Yeah, very cool. We want to thank Jake Wills over on Twitter for the shout out to us, as well as the guys over at We Found a Book podcast. I've been working my way through their archives, and they have some really interesting stories there. And also a big thank you to Tanner over at Legends, Myths, and Whiskey for his kind comments about our show on his show. And we love his podcast right back. And this is another podcast that you should be listening to if you like Myths and Legends. Legends, Myths, and Whiskey is perfect, even if you aren't a drinker. And also over on Twitter, Fanny Frankenfurter said, I enjoyed the old Salem episode. I took field trips there as a kid, but never saw the cemeteries. I plan to remedy that soon. Pretty cool to be able to go there on a school trip. And Corey Ann Wilson had posted in the Spectacular Crew, can we talk about Genius Loki? I hope I said that right. I just got back from the Topaz Japanese internment camp. While I was there, I was feeling really dark and heavy. I wasn't sure if I was really feeling the spirit of the place or I just knew the history of the spot. As we left, I got a bad stomach ache and asked my companion to take me home. I don't know if I believe in genius Loki, but I want to think I've got some sensitivity to them. Anybody else experience something like this? Is my imagination running away with me? The lunch, maybe that upset my stomach? Then she went on to explain, because I don't know about you guys, but I had never heard of this before. Genius Loki is spirit of the place or guardian of a place. In theory, it's why a church feels peaceful and uplifting, or a prison feels oppressive, etc., which is interesting theory there. In buildings, it can be written off as atmospheric changes, imagination, architecture, etc. There are no buildings left at Topaz, though. It's basically just a sagebrush desert, with a few foundations and signs indicating where the guardhouse, mess hall, school, etc. were. So what about it, guys? Have any of you, have you heard of that before? Do you think that there's something to that? I said, I know that when I've heard on various shows or investigators, when they talk about walking into a room where they felt nauseous, it usually indicates evil. Well, and I have a guy that I work with just recently, we were talking about things and he said that when he used to live up, can't remember if it's when he lived in Virginia, but there was an area of road that was where one of the Civil War battles were fought there. And he, it just completely creeped him out if he had to drive home from work at night. And so he would go through all this stuff, like make sure he had a full tank of gas, make sure everything was okay so he didn't have to stop at all on that road because he just would have such a creepy feeling the whole way through this certain stretch of highway. So it could have been the same thing there, too. We want to welcome to the Spectacular Crew, Madison. Hey, Madison. Melody. Hey, Melody. Kevin. Hey, Kevin. Dylan. Hi, Dylan. Ken. Hey, Ken. And Judith. Hey, Judith. And congratulations to Michelle Boyd. She was the winner of the February exclusive t-shirt drawing. All right. Way to go, Michelle. Denise, are you ready to check out the Felt Mansion? I am. Here we go. Become an executive producer of the History Goes Bump podcast for as little as a buck a month. For $5 a month, you can access exclusive content like the Haunted True Crime Bonus Cast. And for $10 and above a month, you get all that plus awesome History Goes Bump gear. Check out patreon.com slash history goes bump for more information. Or you can give us a one-time donation by clicking the donate button at historygoesbump.com. History is full of oddities, curiosities, mysteries, and the truly bizarre. Welcome to this moment in oddity. Today's moment in oddity is by Bob Sherfield. 
And we'd like to take this moment to welcome Bob to the HGB Research Crew as our official oddities editor. There is in South London a tunnel that runs between the Sydenham and Pinch entrances of Crystal Palace Gardens. This tunnel, which was only in operation between August 27th and October 31st, 1864, was designed to test and operate a most peculiar type of train, one that operated on the principle of the vacuum. A carriage was fitted with a large collar of bristles and then sucked along an airtight tunnel for a distance of 600 yards. The carriage, which could seat 35 people, was propelled or sucked through the tunnel by means of a large steam-powered fan, some 20 feet in diameter. Passengers would be charged six pence to take the trip, and it reportedly ran in the afternoon. An article in the Mechanics Magazine, circa 1865, reported that, quote, The motion is, of course, easy and pleasant, and the ventilation ample, without being in any way excessive. All the mechanical arrangements are so simple and must be so obvious, we imagine that it is needless to dwell on them. We feel tolerably certain that the day is not very distant when metropolitan railway traffic can be conducted on this principle with so much success, as far as popular liking goes, that the locomotive will be unknown on underground lines." End quote. After its closure, the location of the tunnel fell from memory. It may have been destroyed in 1911. And by the 1930s, urban legends began to grow. School children would tell stories that a tunnel collapse had occurred on the line, trapping and entombing its passengers who remained there till this day. In 1978, a woman even claimed to have found the tunnel and seen in it the carriage filled with skeletons dressed in Victorian clothing. Using a vacuum to transport a train certainly is odd. Are you afraid of the dark? (laughs) That's just silly. What you should be afraid of is the thing that watches you sleep. (laughs) This Day in History Today's This Day in History is by Jessica Bell. On this day, March 5th in 1496, King Henry VII of England issues letters patent to John Cabot and his sons, authorizing them to explore unknown lands. Cabot wanted to be part of an expanding frontier of exploration of the Atlantic Ocean. The leaders in this enterprise were the Portuguese and the Spanish. The monarchs of both countries wanted to find new routes to Asia and its riches while avoiding the Mediterranean and the virtual monopoly on the spice trade held by the Italians. Neither Portugal nor Spain was interested in John Cabot. As a result, Cabot turned in 1494 or 1495 to the merchants of the port of Bristol, where he settled with his family and to the king, Henry VII. His scheme was to reach Asia by sailing west across the North Atlantic. He estimated that this would be shorter and quicker than Columbus's southerly route. On June 24, 1497, 50 days into the voyage, Cabot landed on the east coast of North America. Though the precise location of this landing is subject to controversy, Some historians believe that Cabot landed at Cape Breton Island or mainland Nova Scotia. Others believe he may have landed at Newfoundland, Labrador, or even Maine. Cabot claimed the land for England and returned to Bristol, arriving in August. The fact that Cabot had found a new continent soon became known in Europe, and early in 1498, Henry VII authorized a second expedition consisting of five ships and 300 men. After landing in Greenland, Cabot sailed southward, probably as far as Chesapeake Bay, but failing to find the rich lands he had envisaged, and because supplies were running low, he turned back towards England. It appears that Cabot perished on this voyage, though one or more of his ships may have returned to Bristol. Most historians maintain that he was probably lost off the coast of Newfoundland. Cabot's voyages provided the basis for England's claim to North America and led to the opening of the rich Northwest Atlantic fishery. In 1997, to mark the Canadian celebration of the 500th anniversary of Cabot's expedition, the Canadian and British governments have both accepted a widely held conclusion that the Cabot's landing site was at Cape Bonavista, Newfoundland. You're listening to History Goes Bump! The Felt Mansion was meant to be a beautiful and spacious place of escape during the summer for the Felt family. 
It was a representation of a successful life set on the shores of Lake Michigan. Death doesn't care about family or success. It comes when we least expect it and at cruel times. And that is what happened to the Felt family. Now, it would seem that family spirits have chosen to stay here in the afterlife. But there is something else here, something eerie. Those mysterious shadow people have also made this their home. And on top of that, an urban legend has arisen from the mansion as well. Join us as we explore the history, legends, and hauntings of the Felt Mansion. The area where Felt Mansion will be located was once the land of the Gun Lake tribe. They are officially known as the Machibi Nashiwish Band of the Potawatomi tribe. The name comes from their chief. The band claims to be a mixture of Chippewa, Ottawa, and Potawatomi. The chief was known in English as Bad Bird. The United States was trying to expand into the northwest regions, and a band of tribes known as the Western Confederacy put up resistance, resulting in the Northwest Indian War. The United States won, and Bad Bird signed a treaty giving up much land to European settlement. The later Treaty of Chicago gave the tribe land near Kalamazoo for a village, but seven years later, Bad Bird would sign another treaty giving up that tract. So there's been much turmoil here on the land. William C. Butler came to the area and founded Kalamazoo Village. He platted out the village in 1833, and as we all know, the plot is in the plat. <laughs> we will forever laugh about that, Denise, because you're like, plat, that can't be the proper term. <laughs> and then mom's like, the plot is in the plat. <laughs> okay. So, but all seriousness, the city was incorporated in 1868, and a postmaster suggested the name Sagatuck for the city, and it was adopted. Sagatuck became a lumber and port city and then home to an art colony. The arts and crafts movement was popular here. Today it is considered the art coast of Michigan. It's a resort town with white sand beaches and grassy dunes, which is what attracted Dor Felt to the area. Dor Eugene Felt was born in 1862 in Wisconsin. He decided he was through with school at the age of 14 and he left home to find work. Mechanics was always an interest of his and he got his first job at a machine shop. He learned as he went, and before long, he was inventing things. At 22, he came up with an idea for a new calculating machine. He had no money, so he built a prototype from, get this, Denise, a macaroni box, rubber bands, skewers, and staples. He took the contraption to a businessman by the name of Robert Tarrant. He liked the idea, and the two men formed the Felt and Tarrant Manufacturing Company. They called the invention the Comptograph. It was the first printing adding machine. It made Felt a rich man. He went on to acquire 46 American patents and 25 foreign patents. That original macaroni box prototype is now at the Smithsonian Museum. I was just in my brain trying to figure out how a macaroni box, rubber bands, skewers, and staples were like a calculator, basically. Maybe you counted the rubber bands. I'm not sure. I'll have to go see it someday. I've, I've kind of, I think I've seen a picture of the Comptograph. Have you ever seen those really old adding machines where the buttons are coming up out of it? They're really big buttons and you push them down and then you'd like pull the lever and then you'd push the buttons down and you'd pull the lever. Okay. I think it was something like uh, that. And so however he had the rubber bands that he probably had, I don't know, I'd, I, I've, would love to go to the Smithsonian and see what it looks like. I'm thinking he had cut up part of the macaroni box so it would be like cardboard numbers that would move or something. I don't know. I don't know. So I guess that's on for another road trip. <laughs> Felt married Agnes McNulty in 1891, and they had four daughters. He and Agnes had enough money that they could splurge on a summer home. He picked a piece of land near Lake Michigan and bought several acres in 1919. The area is so beautiful it was once referred to as the Midwest Riviera. Much of what is now the Sagatuck Dune State Park comes from Felt's land. Felt wanted a home big enough for not only him and Agnes, but also for the families of their daughters. Construction began on the 12,000-square-foot Georgian-style mansion in 1925, and it was completed in 1928. The roof was slate-tiled. There were 25 rooms and a beautiful ballroom up on the third floor with a dome roof. Originally, the ballroom was supposed to be just an attic, so the only stairs leading up to it are the narrow servant stairs. 
Unique accents in the ballroom were star-shaped lights. A metal circular staircase leads from the ballroom up to the widow's walk. I'm just picturing that would make an amazing dojang. If you saw a picture of it, you would be very jealous and want that. It was across almost the entire house, it looked like. Oh, that just seems really neat, just kind of up there on its own with the dome ceiling. The library was paneled in wormy chestnut and had a small brick fireplace with a wood-carved mantel. The kitchen had blue and cream tile throughout with a stainless steel sink and counters. There was a large pantry and cupboards that rose to the ceiling. The master suite had a fireplace, four large windows, a master bath, and an enclosed sleeping porch, which I thought was kind of cool. I'd love to have one of those here at our house. (laughs) Absolutely. We do. We have a huge one out there. Yeah, but it's kind (laughs) of open. It's not what I would say is enclosed. It's enclosed in screen. This is true. And then the lizards could come at night. Oh, no, no, no. I don't want lizards crawling on me. Thank you. They go to bed at night. I don't know. How do we know? Because I I don't see them at night. You're right. But then the salamanders come out. The closets and all the bedrooms were lined with red cedar. The bathrooms were all fully tiled with inlaid soap dishes. Showers had multiple jet streams of water. A carriage house was built to house Felt's automobile collection. I love how they called it a carriage house. A second floor was built above the garages to serve as a place for the caretaker to stay. The mansion really was an extraordinary home. The story turned sad here. Agnes really never had the opportunity to enjoy the summer home. Only six weeks after completion, Agnes passed away in the mansion. Felt himself died a year and a half later from a stroke. Isn't that sad? So they get their dream summer home built. She's dead within six weeks, and a year and a half later, he's gone. So neither one of them really got to enjoy. This happens all the time when people are getting ready to retire, and then the guy has a heart attack, and they don't get to live out their dream of getting the RV and just touring the country and that kind of thing. Exactly. So it's kind of like they worked so hard for their dream, and then boom. The family kept the felt mansion, which was known as Shore Acres Farm at the time, until 1949. Their father's inventions had become obsolete, and the cost of upkeep on the large property was too much. The St. Augustine Catholic Seminary bought the mansion and used it to house students. Later, they leased it to the Dominican cloistered nuns. In 1977, the state of Michigan bought the mansion and used it as a police building. The state built the Michigan Dunes Correctional Facility on 44 acres. Later, Lake Town Township bought the property from the state for $1, and they knocked down the prison. And the stipulation for that $1 price was that it would never be used for a private enterprise, that it would always have to be kind of an open-to-the-public kind of thing. The Felt Mansion has been undergoing renovation since 2002 when the Friends of the Felt Estate formed after Pat Hoosey Meyer and her husband Dean were hiking in the park and saw the mansion. Pat knew they needed to restore the place. Today it's available for weddings and receptions, and there are tours and other social gatherings. It looks like a really great place, and the official website, which I believe is feltmansion.org, has pictures of a dining room, and then where they set up for receptions, and there's like a wedding chapel that's on the property too, that I believe is a chapel they moved from somewhere else and put there. It's all really beautiful. But I don't know what other parts of the mansion have been restored or have been used up. I know the outside has been almost fully restored, I believe, and the landscaping and everything's been taken care of because it was horribly overgrown. He had planted exotic plants, and they had a pond out there and a a brick kind of wall, and it was just very neat. And over time, it's gotten overgrown. The Felt Mansion plays host to more than just living guests. There are spirits here ranging from known ghosts to shadow people. But before we talk about those supernatural entities, we should discuss the urban legend that surrounds the mansion. Apparently, melon heads roam about outside the mansion. And Denise, typically when I hear the term melon heads, I think candy. Oh, yeah. Sort of like lemon heads. Yeah. So I'm thinking, what is a melon head? I don't think they're sweet. No. Melon heads are apparently these human-like creatures with large bulbous heads that come out of hiding to attack people. Ah, Cabbage Patch Kids. (laughs) That's where they went to. Actually, 
Did you ever hear about the Garbage Pail Kids? Oh, yeah, I had all the cards. Yeah, so did I. Maybe they're more like that. Have you ever heard of that before? I've never heard of Melon Head Kids. This is a brand new urban legend to me. I have never heard anything like this before. Or I guess they're just Melon Heads. I just made them into a new doll. Well, they are kids. Oh, they are kids. Yeah, yeah that's right. This urban legend, apparently, maybe you've heard of it, listeners out there, if you're from Michigan, Ohio, or Connecticut, because this is the urban legends in all three of those states. The legend attached to Felt Mansion is that these are children who were suffering from hydrocephalus and being housed at the nearby Junction Insane Asylum. They somehow became free, but they were so damaged by the abuse they'd endured that they were feral and wild. The 2011 movie The Melonheads features the legend. In truth, there never was a Junction Insane Asylum in Michigan, but the former correctional facility has been referenced as well. I don't know why there'd be a bunch of kids who are sick at a correctional facility, but okay. The story gets wild to the point of claiming the kids killed the doctor who was torturing them, and they cut up his body and spread the parts outside of the mansion. Supposedly, his spirit is seen in the mansion as well as the children's spirits. Hmm. So that is new on me. I have never heard that urban legend before. Neither have I. So we would definitely like to hear from our listeners who live in those three states if they that was an urban legend you heard growing up. Yeah, I mean, was that a, a threat to you guys? Or And what, what is interesting about this is why did this rise up around the Felt Mansion? Because it really is specific to that location, especially when there was no asylum. So what made them all of a sudden create this story? We know that urban legends come from something generally that has a little bit of truth to it. So were there some kids who had some kind of disease that were for some reason near the mansion? I wonder if the nuns had something that they took care of because it was it was that the cloistered nuns. I don't know. It's just strange. It's like, where would this have come from? It's so unusual. Yeah, so again, if listeners know that answer, let us know that as well. Yeah, because it's not like usually when you hear an urban legend about a quote-unquote creature it's you know some kind of an animal type thing not a kid with a big head (laughs) exactly who attacks people oh when it comes to spirits agnes felt is the most prominent one her full-bodied apparition has been seen in various areas of the house she startles guests often as she just appears next to them out of nowhere and seems to want to carry on a conversation Her disembodied voice and footsteps are heard as well. The room where Agnes died has a set of French doors. They open and close by themselves, and the West Michigan Ghost Hunter Society caught it on video once. And if you Google it on YouTube, probably Felt Mansion, French doors, it'll pop up. You know, maybe they timed it themselves, but the guy that's passing by the doors when they open up seems legitimately scared, and he runs. (laughs) So uh, it's it's pretty bizarre. When they close, it's just real slowly and barely. You almost don't see it. But when it opens, it opens wide and quickly. And I mean, there's nobody near it. So hmm. it's an interesting video. Of course, unless you're actually the person shooting it, it's always hard to know if it's staged or not. But And then there are the shadow people. Where these entities come from, nobody knows because Agnes is the only person we know to have died at the property. The shadow people are seen mostly in the third floor ballroom, and they seem to be interacting with the ballroom. One entity has been seen apparently sweeping the floor, and other shadowy figures sway to and fro on the dance floor. This makes us wonder about energy and time and what was captured here. Are these just replays of days gone by and not actual spirits, perhaps seen as shadows because they are trapped memories or moments in time? Shadow people have long fascinated us because they seem to have no explanation. Denise, this is why I kind of got into the background about what Native American tribes were here, what was going on here, because anytime I see this stuff with shadow people, I try to figure out what is bringing these entities here. But then I got to thinking, generally when people see a shadow person, it's this just blacker than black blob-like thing that's just blocking out the light or seems to be absorbing all the light. And generally, when people talk about shadow people, they feel almost an evil presence. These don't seem to be giving off that kind of energy, and they actually seem to be interacting, doing as if, like, sweeping the floor. Hmm. It almost, to me, seems like 
maybe there's some kind of scientific explanation that the reason why it's a shadow is because we're seeing a time event. And so it's not clear because it's not actually happening right now. That could be almost like a residual, but Mm -hmm. in a veil or something. But yeah, even different than residual that it's just, you know, with me, I sometimes wonder if some of these ghost things are just time travel things happening or time crossing or what have you. And then we have from the Michigan Other Side website, quote, I can say from a personal experience, we had some strange stuff happened while helping out the tours. Doug of Ghostly Talk Radio remembers standing outside at the mansion and seeing Tom Matt from Michigan's Other Side.com standing very close to someone by the large fountain. They seemed so close that Doug asked Tom who he was getting so buddy-buddy with by the fountain. Tom told Doug that he hadn't been standing next to anyone over there, but that Doug's story confirmed what he had been feeling, that someone unseen was standing right next to him. I personally saw some of the wildest shadow people on video while recording in the ballroom on the third floor. I was there for an all-night Halloween event, and it was around 3.30 a.m. We had set up a night shot camera in the ballroom and sat back to watch if anything would happen on a television in the next room. In the far corner of the ballroom, which is now next to the newly installed restrooms, a shadowy figure stepped out from nowhere. Everyone in the room suddenly came down with a case of the chills and goosebumps. The figure appeared to be human-like and blacker than the shadows around it. It had density. It seemed to be doing a sweeping motion, as if it were holding a broom. Suddenly, a second figure appeared next to it, And then as quickly as they had materialized, they were both gone. Southeast Michigan ghost hunters were a paranormal team there as well, and everyone tried to recreate the event by standing in the back of the ballroom, seeing if our shadows could have made the movements, but nothing we did equaled what we'd saw on video. The shadows had appeared in a corner where we had a mock graveyard set up with tombstones and other Halloween props. I had made a couple of tombstones and wasn't keen on walking over to that corner to pick them up during the cleanup, even with the lights on. I don't blame them. (laughs) Neither do I. Of course, the video went home with an investigator who later got out of the study and the video was never seen again. This was before things were digital. Even without video proof, it was an experience no one that night will quickly forget. End quote. Now, it's my understanding that these ghost hunts, and I think they used to do ghost tours as well, were taking place when they were doing the major restoration, and I don't believe they do any of that anymore. So I think you can do tours there, but I don't know that any of them are actual ghost tours, and I didn't see anything on the website about ghost tours. That sounds like it would have been a creepy place to have a Halloween shindig. Exactly, and just to see... Like what they saw, it's too bad that that tape disappeared. Yeah, I mean, you you always wonder, like, did that person not realize what you had there? Or I don't know. That's why you want to make sure you get copies, I guess, of everything. One of the crazier rumors we have heard that has no historical documentation to back it up is that Agnes died because she committed suicide by jumping from her bedroom window. It continues that at 1.28 a.m. every morning, her ghost is seen crossing the room and jumping from the window but she disappears before hitting the ground. This would explain why her ghost would be here, but it's highly unlikely. I don't know where that rumor got started because I found nothing on a death certificate or anything that indicated suicide. Now, of course, back then they didn't like to talk too much about that stuff, but newspapers sometimes will get into some of the seedy side of things and the death notice and stuff that I read about her just indicated that if they were shocked that she had passed away because she was, I think, 68. But at, at that time, that was, you know, people didn't live to be quite as old as we do now. So there was no indication that this is somebody who had committed suicide. As far as I know, Agnes is the only person who died here. Now, maybe some of the seminary, a seminary student did or something, but I have no idea. And there, there was the prison nearby. So that's the other thing. I don't know what was going on over at the correctional facility. And if maybe that's where some of these shadow figures are coming from, too. Who knows? Or it was land owned by all of those tribes, by that tribe. And so there could have been some stuff there. And it was very tumultuous during that time. 
you know, just with um, the wars and losing the land and all of that. So the felt mansion is today coming back into its former grandeur. Do ghosts roam its spacious interior? Is Agnes trying to enjoy the summer house and the afterlife to make up for not having more time while she was living? Are there such things as melon heads? Is the felt mansion haunted? That is for you to decide. Well, Denise, it's another location for us to visit in Michigan. Yes, it is. And so we're, we got a lot of places to visit on that road trip. <laughs> yes, we do. On our next episode, we have set to feature the University of Montevallo. Montevallo? Yeah. That's just a fun name. Yeah. It was suggested by our listener, Lisa Atkinson. It's where she went to school. And apparently, it's got some ghosts, not just students. You know, we hear of a lot of hauntings on college campuses and schools, and it's just amazing how many people are just like, oh, and go back to bed. I would like be home, done, dropped out of school. And we have some reviews to share. Uh, the first one is a four-star review, and I'm just going to say the name is Hey What, because part of it is a curse word that I don't want to say. The ladies can get to me a little bit, but I do enjoy this podcast, and three stars seem just a tad low. I've listened to nearly all episodes, so I've enjoyed it and continued on with it. Well, we must be better than three stars if you've listened to all the shows. That's a lot of shows to listen to. Well, that's what he said, so he gave us four. Yeah. Thank you. Amazed, five stars, Banshee Fiend. So pleased to find this very informative podcast. Diane and Denise and the research team do an amazing job. I love listening to them as I work on my art or while on a road trip with my paranormal team. I was hooked once I listened to the podcast about Disney haunting. I'm a former cast member, and this was perfect. Thanks so much, ladies. Keep up the fab work. Yay. And I believe that is Anna, who's with Proof Paranormal, that probably posted that. So thank you for that. And Proof Paranormal, I still love their name. <laughs> and then from Canada, we have another five-star review. Amazing combo history and paranormal from We Wonder. I heard about this podcast from two others I listened to in the same day, so I thought this must be a good one. I was donating within three episodes because Bizarre States and Real Ghost Stories Online was so right. This is an amazing combo of history, odd news, and paranormal. Diane and Denise are the cutest wifey combo, and I love it when they go off on their little giggle moments. Thanks, ladies. So I guess you giggled too. Oh, no. <laughs> Thank you, we wonder. And then, Denise, I am so excited. And this is perfect because we're in March. And what is the holiday that we have in March? My birthday. Okay, well, other than that, St. Patrick's Day. <laughs> yes, we got our first review from Ireland. Yay, Ireland, Woo my country. <laughs> Ireland's my country, actually. Exactly. Since I'm now the ambassador. Now you're the ambassador. Mm -hmm. So now we finally got a review there. Thank you, Diana and Denise. Five stars from Laura. I know I'm going to kill your last name. Is it Irie or Eerie? I think it's Irie. I usually like anything to do with oddities, but some podcasts can be just a bit too much. This podcast is different and better. Diane and Denise, who present this podcast, are not trying to horrify you with blood and guts, but incorporate some real interesting paranormal stories with history. The episode about Old Salem, North Carolina was one of my favorites so far. I listened to this on my way to work in Cork, Ireland, and I'm always captivated. I really enjoy the banter between Diane and Denise. Also, thank you so much. Well, thank you, Laura. We appreciate that. We'd love to join you when we make it over to Ireland sometime. Yes, and we're actually looking towards next spring of 2017. So keep listening and we'll let you know when we're headed your way across the pond. And this puts pressure on you other countries out there. Who else wants to jump into the fray? We've got Canada, the United Kingdom, Australia, and now Ireland. Come on, you French guys. I know you've been listening. You're our next largest group of listeners, so... Let's see if we can get some reviews from some other countries as well. We'd love that. Let's go far, far east because in about four years, we will be in China. So come on, let's get knowing our people there too. We want to thank you guys for joining us for this episode. I have been your host, Diane. And this has been Denise. You take care now. Bye-bye. This episode has been brought to you by our executive producers. We want to welcome new executive producer, Jose Zelaya. And thank you to Anna Frias and Rick Kennett for your one-time donations. We appreciate them. Thank you. Check out the website at historygoesbump.com Societies rise and societies fall. 
When the time comes, one society steps forward to build a better future. The Wicked Library, Kettle and Whistle Radio, Ninth Story Podcast, Prog Watch, Red Horse Radio, The Lift, History Goes Bump, Listen, The M Writing Podcast. Society 13. Rebuilding society. One podcast at a time.